Okay, hello. I'm Bianca, or Animate as my artist name, and I'm a freelance art director and 3D designer based in Germany. So by now I have more than 20 years of experience in various disciplines of post-production and motion design, but recently I concentrate on creating very graphical-looking designs and animations. So to give you an impression of my work, let's start right away with a brief insight in some projects over the past years in the motion design industries. So here we go. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to hold this presentation here at the FMX. During my studies around two decades ago, we made a first excursion to the FMX, and I was really thrilled. Back then I was studying communication design, and I didn't have any clue of all this 3D stuff. But right after our excursion, I started learning by myself. And additionally, with our final year project, Anybotics, my dear fellow student Timo Dechert and I, we won the FMX New Talent Award and the first place DVD, DVD design at the Animago. So that was the first time I had the opportunity to show my work at the FMX. And last year, I held my very first presentation for Maxon. There, I talked a bit about my career and even presented this final year project I mentioned. You're welcome to watch the whole presentation at the Maxon YouTube channel. Check it out. So last year I walked you through some projects of mine. And this year I decided to concentrate on a specific topic, yeah, such as volumes. And that's why the title of the presentation is Race the Volumes. I perfectly well know that the volume technique isn't something really new. But I'm totally in love with this technique because it offers uh, almost endless possibilities. I always look at the tools and techniques and then I think about how I can use them for my graphical designs. And with all these new inventions during the last years, I want to give you a good overview of what you can do with volumes in this area. Moreover, at the end of last year, uh, Maxon introduced the Pyro tool, which is volume based too. And I had the pleasure to experiment with this new tool even before it was released. So check out the recording of the webinar in December 2022 if you are interested. And you will find that one in the Maxon Training Team channel. It's called Demystifying Post-Production all, all Fired Up. So let's have, have a, pre a preview of these scenes. These are just experimental scenes with the tool. So I tested and played around with all the settings and the materials and yeah, what you can achieve with uh, graphical techniques. So there are these puffy mushrooms, this experimental class, mixing two colors, these uh, bouncing platonic stuff and uh, the combination of simulations together with pyro. So. For some time now, everything is about Cinema 4D's unified simulation system, and that with good reason. But I don't want you to forget about all these other nice techniques, such as volumes. Now, before we start with, this, with the fun part, I want to give you a very, very brief understanding of how volumes work. Um, and don't be afraid, I won't bore you for long. It's just important to know some basic stuff before we start experimenting. So the most important point is 
volumes work with voxels. So everyone knows about pixels. It's like a tiny, very tiny square and the number of pixels in X and Y produce a two-dimensional image. So voxels are also known as 3D pixels or volumetric pixels. And one voxel is like a little cube in a 3D grid. And the number of voxels in X, Y, Z, in this case, produce a 3D object in this voxel grid. So just keep this in mind, because the more accurate your model or simulation shall be, the more voxels you will need. Therefore, you have to decrease the voxel size to get better results and not to increase. So the thing is now, high-res voxel objects need some time to calculate. So just be careful while decreasing the voxel size or you are likely to crash your system. And uh, yeah, everybody knows about uh, polygons in the 3D world. The difference is polygons uh, describe like a hull around the object and uh, voxels fill a volume a vo uh, an object up from the inner side. So this is how the tool itself works. But as being a designer, I don't want to create realistic... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to go to cinema, please. <laughs> so I was in the flow. <laughs> Do we get it? Yes. So this really extensive scene, I took a while to create this one. Um, there is this uh, cube and a helix spline, some spheres in a cloner and a mole spline object. So let's add this uh, pyro simulation tag. Here we go. And without further explanations, I just hit play. So we see the tag itself, the tool itself works correctly, but it doesn't look very nice at this state. So what can we do? There are different possibilities. Let's see? Um, while creating this uh, pyro emitter tag, uh, automatically this pyro output object was created. And you will need this one for caching and uh, fundamental or basic settings of your pyro simulation scene. Um, there is also the possibility to go to the project attributes, to, to the project settings, and adjust the settings here. They are linked together. So it's up to you which you choose. So, what can we do? We talked about the voxel size and they are at default at 5 centimeters. So, let's decrease them to 2 in this case. And let's grab all the tags. And each object has a, a known tag, but there is only one pyro output object. So, we can grab all the tags together if you want to, or separately, up to you. So, let's decrease the surface thickness. So the uh, emitting fire and smoke stays closely to the outer shape of your objects. Let's hit play. And you see immediately the effect. It's much more accurate right now. Um, yeah, and you can adjust a lot of stuff here in this tool. Let's have a look what you can adjust. So as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned already, in the Pyro object, there is this voxel size. This is very essential. And um, you can uh, 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 animate or adjust the settings for dissipation, for smoothing, etc. And then there are these pyro checks. Let's have a look at them. So I already uh, uh, mentioned the surface thickness. Uh, you can adjust the object fidelity, the color of the smoke. So let's do this right now. Let's choose a green color and simulate again. So it's just the color of the smoke, not of the fire. So it looks a bit weird, but if you want to produce just smoke, it will look really good because you can uh, define different colors for each tag. So you can add or disable temperature. Temperature stands for fire and density stands for smoke in this tool. You can add fuel also, and you can also use the strengths of, of, velo of velocity. I'll show you later. So this was just a very basic example scene. Let's go to another basic scene. So there's this one. It's just uh, uh, some cloned spheres animated with this formula effector. So nothing really spectacular, but 
if we enable the pyrotech and hit play, um, immediately there are uh, these interesting shapes. And you have just to uh, uh, think about what you can do with this technique, like uh, some kind of uh, fire painting or whatever. Just be creative. <laughs> so in this case, I adjusted mainly the velocity because uh, the objects are moving um, yeah, a bit fast. And this is better for calcula calculating uh, the fire and the smoke. Um, so it calculates every frame and it's, it looks smoother in the end. So, in this example scene, I uh, used a vertex map. And uh, in this vertex map, a torus field moves, this torus field here, moves along this plane and stops. So, if we enable our pyro tag, fire and smoke is exactly produced where the torus field moves over the plane. So, but how can you achieve this effect? You have to use the vertex map and drag and drop it into your, if you are producing smoke, into the density channel or if you want to produce fire in the temperature channel. So here's the vertex map and this is for the smoke, the vertex map. So this is how the tool itself work. So now to get, uh, getting back to PowerPoint, please. Great. So, yeah, uh, but as I told you, uh, as being a designer, I don't want to create realistic fire and smoke, but more abstract and graphical designs. So in this example scene here, I first simulated some platonics falling into a bowl and bouncing around a bit, all the while producing smoke and only smoke in this case. So let's see how this is done in cinema. Open up the scene with the bouncing, bouncing platonics. Here we go. So I simulated the uh, bouncing platonics already. Yeah, I recommend simulating all your simulations before adding a pyrotech. It's better for your computer system and your personal stress level both, so <laughs> just do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is how they are simulated. So here is the animated or simulated cloner object with the platonics, and I'm using the cache mode here. Great. So when enabling the pyro, we have our smoke. And that is animated from frame 29 to frame 30 in this case, when the first platonic touches the bowl. So I adjusted in this case uh, the voxel size of the of the smoke and uh, nothing more in this object but in the pyrotech so here's uh, the enabling of the uh, of the tech itself you can animate this here on off and back again so i adjusted the surface thickness and the velocity because the bouncing platonics move fast so let's go to some frame like this here and see what we get when we open up the redshift render view. So just enabling the menu where it is. There it is. So open up the redshift render view. One moment. Let it process. That just takes a few seconds or another few seconds. Ah, here we go. Great. Um, but not that great because in the viewpoint we have already a lot of smoke. But in our render there is no smoke. So what, we, what can we do? We need a material. So for Redshift, we create a Redshift material, and in this case, the Pyro volume material. And you add this Pyro volume material to the Pyro object, not to the object itself, but to the Pyro object. And immediately we see the smoke is rendered, but 
It's very dull looking. It's uh, like realistic grayish smoke. And I didn't want realis a realistic grayish smoke. So I adjusted the material. Let's delete this one and use my already adjusted material. So here we go. I wanted to pro produce these uh, yeah, almost velvet-like look uh, in various shades of pink matching to the colors of my pinkish scene here. So let's have a look at the material itself. Here we go. Just open up the note edit editor. And here are the gradients. So there are several gradients in the material setup. So there's this gradient for the channel density, and density is the smoke. And uh, I used in another scene the temperature channel. So for this scene, I only used smoke, so I only had to adjust the gradient for the density channel. So you can, yeah, you can choose uh, whatever colors you like. You like, and uh, let's see when we. I started with black here, and I show you why. When we delete the black color at the beginning of this gradient, everything looks a bit weird. And uh, that's because the uh, black color at the start of the gradient works yeah, almost like, an, like a kind of alpha channel. So let's undo this because that doesn't look very nice. So here we go. Back again with our pinkish smoke. Great. So, we just jump back to PowerPoint, please. Yeah. This here is my next example scene. It's a simple rope simulation with some soft shimmering along one of these ropes. And I want to show you directly how this is done. So, we just head back to cinema. We don't need this scene anymore. Let's open up the flamey ropes. Here we are. So let's make this viewport a bit bitter, bigger. And yeah, here we go. So I created uh, this rope simulation and it's already cached. As I mentioned, please cache your simulations before adding pyro. And uh, there is this rope four and I added a vertex map. So this is the red color here. And in this vertex map, I used the spherical field. And I animated this field, starting at frame 100, along, moving along this rope and scaling down in the end. And that's exactly where the, rope, uh, the fire should be emitted. So let's see how this works. Here it comes. The fire comes exactly where the spherical field moves along the rope. And that's because I showed you already, you have to... Uh, oops. I need more space, so here we go. It's, I used the vertex map and it's put inside of the temperature as for the fire. And in this case, it's just the fire. There is no smoke. You see it in the viewport, but I uh, cached only the, the fire. And for caching, you need this pyro output object. So you have to uh, uh, select which channels you want to cache. Uh, in this case, I uh, oh I did cache the density, but that doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, I cached the density and the temperature. Um, and then you can see here it's loaded into the cache, it's a VDB sequence. This is written on your hard disk and you can scrub through the timeline and don't have to wait. So, okay, let's have a look at this material. Open up the Redshift render view. Let's render this one. Yes, here it is. Okay, and let's check the material itself. So in the scene before, we adjusted the gradient for the smoke. In this case, we adjusted the gradient for the fire. So I chose several colors matching to my yeah, 
pastel colored robes. Um, I showed you why, uh, what happens when you delete uh, the first black color. In this case, I ended with a black color. Let's see what happens when I delete this one. You see immediately the, the effect. Uh, in these Turkish areas, uh, the fire gets much more denser. And uh, if we just undo this, like again, you see through the fire, the rope. So play around with the settings in your materials. There are really nice results to achieve. Okay, yeah. so let's go back to PowerPoint. Yeah, as you could see, you can achieve very graphical and creative results while playing around with the settings to generate fire and smoke, not only of the tool itself, but also with the pyro volume material. So that's quite cool and offers you really many possibilities, but there is one last item on my pyro agenda. You can generate a mesh with pyro. So this is just an abstract still I created with pyro, even if it doesn't look really much like fire. So let's have a look at the scene itself. I'll open up this one here. Another spectacular scene. And it's a sphere moving along a helix spline. Well, well. So let's enable the pyrode object. So in I already cached this. I, I talked about the VDB sequence. And this is just smoke. Looks nice. We cached it. But what I really want to show you is in my next scene. This is here. So you can use the volume loader. And into the volume loader, you can, use, uh, you can uh, load every VDB sequence you get. Uh, if it's from Cinema or an external tool, that doesn't matter. Just load it in your volume loader. And then you can adjust the settings for the volume loader. Um, it recognizes already what you cached, in this case, the density, the smoke. And you can adjust uh, the, the start point and the end point of the animation and yeah, the speed and so on. So if we put the volume loader now into the volume builder, and additionally, and additionally, the volume measure, and wait a few seconds for calculating, smoke turns instantly into liquid. And that is what the volume builder does, um, in, and especially then afterwards the measure. So to create this still, I just used this cube, and it cut through our smoke and created this nice effect. So in the volume builder, you load the volume loader at the bottom. Yeah, I added some smoothing and uh, subtracted this cube and the sphere to create uh, this hole in this area. Additionally, creating another sphere with a little lesser radius and we are done. Just adding some nice materials, some lights and yeah, it's just another technique I want to show you because you can, uh, because you don't need every time external tools. You can create a lot of stuff inside uh, Cinema without the uh, uh, use of uh, external plugins and tools. So, okay, this was this, and let's head back to the presentation. Great, yeah, this was done with this technique. So by now you have a quick overview of how you can use the Pyro tool, especially for graphical renderings. And now let's head over to the volume builder. So I created this intro animation for my retrospect I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. That is this intro animation. And uh, yeah, back about a decade ago, when I started freelancing, I invented my playful little helper. This is the little mate, animate. <laughs> And uh, in this graphical intro, I wanted to give her some kind of instrument to experiment with. And as I do like vintage stuff, I detected pictures of an historical instrument called theodolite. So I des decided to build something similar. But I don't do heavy modeling all day long. And that's why the volume modeling technique came in very handy. So let's check this out. So don't need these scenes anymore. Let's head over to the theodolite. 
So this is the instrument. So at first glance, it doesn't look really detailed or whatever. But if you zoom in and have a look at all these parts of this instrument, there are uh, many threads and uh, this tripod here with cutouts and especially this fixture, fixture at the top of this instrument, this one here. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to model this easily with standard modeling tools. So let's see how we can do this very easily. So here we are. There's just this tube in the center, uh, a cube deformed a bit with, this DF, uh, with uh, FFD to taper a bit and uh, yeah, an extruded spline, two additional tubes and cloning around them three times to generate this tripod here. So it looks very edgy at this state because they're just uh, uh, primitives and basic objects. But if we put them in the volume builder, and enable the volume builder, you have this smooth result. It's one object now. And additionally, I created just a small cube and a cil another cylinder cloned around. And this, we, this I subtracted from the other stuff. So here we go, it just cut through it, it would take a while, I think, when uh, uh, doing this with uh, standard modeling techniques. So, that's easily done in yeah, some short time. Another thing I wanted to show you, which is really useful uh, for, uh, for these threads I showed you, um, this is just a cylinder and a helix spline wrapped around this cylinder. So it has just has the same radius. And we put everything inside our volume builder and uh, subtract the helix spline from the cylinder, we get this nice effect of this thread. And you don't have to put your spline into a sweep nerves or whatever else you, uh, you need. Normally, you can just adjust the radius of the spline inside of the volume builder. So if we uh, just uh, type in a smaller value, it will look that, like that. And let's undo this. So this is what I wanted it to look. For a final touch, I added a cylinder which cut through the whole object. So um, back again to the voxel size. Uh, adjusting voxel sizes with the volume builder depends on the size of your scene. So uh, be careful, again, <laughs> while decreasing this voxel size. And uh, yeah, you have to play around with it to get the results you want to achieve. And uh, another thing with uh, voxels, uh, with volume objects is, um, with the volume object, with the volume builder, uh, you can use smooth layers. And uh, there are different operators, the gauche and the mean, the median, and so on. And uh, you, you just have to uh, experiment which suits you best for the object or the animation, whatever you want to create. So this is this. And last but not least, there is this little spaceship. Let's just enable everything of the volume builder. And this spaceship gives us our fixture. There is a long list of primitives in this. So we start with, the, with this tube, two cylinders, cubes to cut out. And, um, oops, let's, let's show this up. Okay, this cuts through this one. Another one at the at the bottom. Yeah. It's a lot of objects inside of this, but it works in the end and gives you a nice result. So, and additionally, I used these cylinders to cut inside at the sides of these of this uh, fixture. And again, I wanted to cut these edges and to produce these rounded edges. So here we go. Adjust the, the, the voxel size again and you will have a really nice detailed and uh, yeah, uh, object. So for uh, another thing, we have this mesh 
And uh, yeah, this is what the uh, volume measure produces with all these objects inside the volume builder. Uh, if you need a more even mesh, you can use the remesher. So let's use the remesher. Here we go. And put the volume measure into the remesher. Just wait a few seconds because it has to calculate it. But here we are. It's a very even mesh now, consisting of quadrangles. And that's way better for further adjustments or further animations. Um, what I wanted to say is, this, in this uh, scene, I animated uh, rotation, some rotational movements because uh, there are several scenes in my intro sequence. And um, I adjusted uh, lights and materials and whatever it needed to produce this scene. So there is no um, volume object, actually. I made a poly object because it's uh, uh, it's the thing with volume builder with the volume builder is it has to calculate a new each frame when you uh, when you do make changes. So if you are animating stuff or whatever, uh, it has to calculate every frame, and that's annoying. So just break it down to to object if it doesn't if it just uh, is an object or bake your uh, animations as alembics, and then you're fine. Yeah. That was the the or the light. Let's head over to our presentation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. After my little playful helper got her brand new and super nice modeled instrument, she started to experiment right away. So let's have a look at some of her trials. Yeah, and just like every other child, she wanted to play around with Play-Doh. And uh, yeah, how is this done. By the way, uh, thanks to this, uh, to these uh, really nice collection of materials uh, from the guys of Grayscale Gorilla, they uh, uh, produce these tactile uh, materials and they're really nice. Okay, let's open up this scene here. No, we don't need you anymore here. Great. So, here we are. So, another heavy scene for animation. It's a cloner object with some spheres inside. And I animated, it's, uh, it's the grid mode, and I animated the size of the grid. So this is the uh, grid size in the end of this scene. Um, additionally, I animated uh, the uh, random effector at the start of the animation, and then it goes down to zero at the end. So last but not least, there is this push apart effector, which is controlled by the spherical field moving through our grid of spheres. And that was all. So it's an animation you can do in a few minutes. And if you put everything now into our volume builder, so the cloner and uh, some smoothing on top, it produces this nice hull and it deforms and deforms. And I even like these parts when these spheres moves apart and yeah, plop away. It's, uh, and that's, it's, uh, that is uh, because I, uh, why I called this scene cell division. Um, some time ago, I had to produce a medical visualization and uh, there really was a cell division. So one cell splitting into two and it has to be shown really detailed and slow. So uh, um, that was uh, the method I used for this, but in a more extended way. Yeah, that was that. Back again. Yeah, and then there are these simulations. You can use simulations with volume, uh, together with volumes too. And in this somehow weird experiment, uh, I used uh, two different kinds of simulations. So there are these uh, soft body simulations for these abstract tank tackles and a rope simulation for these uh, yeah, organic moving drops along this cord. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you how you can easily combine geometric with organic elements. And let's do this together now. 
So let's open up this spectacular model. We see it, yes, great. Um, yeah, there is this uh, cone object, and along the cone object, I just cloned these uh, tube objects. And uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be a, a very uh, detailed um, uh, uh, model. Uh, you can just use it as it is, because we use the volume builder again. So, here we go. This is our single tentacle. Not a very realistic one, but I'm not so for realistic stuff. So, this is our abstract tentacle, tentacle cloned around five times. Here we are. And then let's add a soft body simulation. So, I'll hit play. And it works nicely, but we want not to, uh, uh, the tentacles to fall down to the ground. We want them to stay, uh, to stay fixed to this uh, and attached to this cube I showed you in this little experiment, experimental test. So how can we do this? Um, we can play around with another vertex map. So this is the vertex map, everything red again. So I used a linear field just here in the, at the start of these tentacles. And now just drag and drop this linear field inside of your vertex map. So you see the colors, red, there is nothing should move, and uh, uh, getting yellowish, and the simulation should be there at 100%. Let's hit play again, and oops, it doesn't work. Why is this? Because we created the vertex map, but we didn't use it in our simulation. So we can select the soft body tag and we have to use pins. So let's uh, enable with pins and drag and drop our vertex map into this slot here. Play again and hooray, it works. And to add a bit more underwater style, I just uh, added a tubu uh, turbulence force. So here we go. Nice. Um, in this scene here, I already cached this simulation. So it's here in the, in the cache. Everything is in the cache mode now, so we can scrub along our timeline. And now we are back to our volume builder. So let's enable our volume builder. Here we are. This is the tube, uh, the cube and uh, the tentacles already cached. And uh, additionally, this cylinder to give the thing a more graphical look now. So this is everything I did for the tentacles. And there are these drops. So these are done with uh, rope simulation. So created, uh, I created this spline here. And uh, uh, I wanted to stay the spline fixed at the start and the end, and at the end point of the spline. So I created uh, these two helper objects, the left belt and the right belt. And uh, for the spline, you add a, a rope simulation tag. And afterwards, you select the start and the end point separately and create separate uh, belt tags. So in this slot here, you just drag and drop your helper objects. So let's see what this produces. Yeah, a swinging rope, more or less what I wanted to. Uh, yeah, we are underwater, so let's add this turbulence here. So yes, that's much more organic in its movement now. So um, let's cache this. Don't worry, this just takes a few seconds. It's just this spline. So now we can scrap along our timeline through the cache simulation. And then afterwards, I created these cloned spheres. Uh, just spheres, cloned, linear. And um, let's show this. I uh, used uh, additionally this displacer and uh, in the shading map 
I used a, a noise map with a very large global scale of 500 in this case, just to give the spheres a more organic look. So, um, I used already uh, additionally the random effector and it uh, yeah, affects the scale of these objects, so they are small and big. And I wanted them to move along our simulated rope. And that's because I cached, I cached uh, the simulation of the rope because these objects should move along and yeah, it's uh, uh, simulated and um, then we, uh, some objects want to follow the simulation, so it's better to cache it before, in my opinion. <laughs> so, okay, um, yeah, then I used the spline effector. And in the spline effector, there is this uh, rope simulation, and I animated the offset and the end of the spline. So it just moves around. So this doesn't look really nice at this state, but ta da! Back to our volume builder. Here we are. So, as I told you already, um, you can just load the spline itself into the volume builder underneath the cloner. And um, what you can do is not only to adjust the radius of the spline, in this case very thick with 30 centimeters, um, you can scale it along the spline too. So like in your sweep. So it can, uh, you can adjust, uh, can decrease it to tap, tap it more, or you can leave it without the scaling. But I wanted this tapering, so here we go. This is our rope simulation with these drops. And this is our final scene. I just added uh, this, this, this torus to give it a more graphical look in the end. And everything is cached. So we can scrub through. And yeah, this is our underwater abstract tentacle scene. Yeah, then we should go back to our presentation. Yeah, all the scenes I showed you before were created with the volume type sign distance field. And these are really good uh, for Boolean operations of any kind. But there is one more volume type, it's the volume type fog. And uh, this one here is done with the fog volume type. It's just a bunch of uh, layered spheres put inside of, uh, uh, of separate volume builders. There are five layers. There is this inner core, this red one here, and this outer wooden hull and three layers of fog noises inside. Yes, let's have a look at that. Here are the fog noises. So, with all our scenes, we start very basically. Again, with just a sphere. Let's just enable the volume builder and measure. So, here is the sphere. i just make this a bit bigger so we can see it much better. So this is the sphere. And uh, um, we used the sign distance field in our scenes before, and now we use the fog type. So, and you get now more additional fog layers. So I used, for this, in this case, the fog multiply. And don't forget uh, to set uh, this to zero here because at default is it, uh, it is at one, and then uh, yeah you won't see any effect. So I and these uh, fog noises, they work together with uh, the fog multiplier. Sorry, uh, it works together with fields, and you can put every field you want you want to inside of this. So in this case, it's just a, a shader field with some. Uh, noise inside, in this case, a dense, and uh, yeah, I adjusted the global scale, and this is what it produces. So, and back again. Okay, then I wanted to look inside of each layer of our spheres. So I created one spherical field, this is the big one here, and this spherical field affects each layer of our 
volume builders. So we have five volume builders and it affects uh, each layer. So you can, uh, 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 yeah, you can choose which shade of, uh, which field you want to use, uh, shade of field, uh, uh, spherical or whatever you want. You can animate everything. So it's, it stays connected and editable. So uh, uh, just use one for everything and yeah, don't do everything for itself. Just easy, uh, uh, just um, reduce your scenes. Okay, and uh, uh, what I shown, wanted to show you more in this scene is uh, we have this inner core, the red one in, in the still, and I wanted to create a gap between the first layer of uh, fog noise and uh, this core. So I additionally created uh, this, another spherical field, this one here, to cut inside. And yeah, we get our gap. So this is a second layer. It's done with the same technique. So just let's disable these ones and let's have a look at the third layer. And let's just disable these cutting fields. So if you just use a sphere, a simple sphere, and this uh, fog multiply with a shader effector, uh, effector and uh, yeah, in this case I used uh, the Crenel noise uh, with a very large global scale of 700. Uh, yeah, you have to play around uh, because it produces such nice effects. You can see through the object and inside of the object. So I love this technique. Um, let's enable the rest of our scene. So they are underneath the sphere. So we have to enable the spherical field to look inside. Here we go. And this other spherical field to cut further into this object to see the other layers of our layered spheres. So the outer hull, uh, I created uh, 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 this outer hull with uh, the standard volume type signed distance field because uh, it calculates a bit faster than uh, uh, the volume type fog and we don't need noises for this outer hull here. Yeah, yeah this uh, um, was everything I wanted to show you in this scene. And yeah, this is what we created just now. Yeah, and with all these example seeds I've shown you that you can feed in nearly everything while working with volumes. It, you can feed in splines, meshes, cloner objects, fields, and vertex maps, uh, simulations, particles, even rigged objects or whatever you want and many, many more. And uh, you can render everything either with the volume material, the pyro volume material, or you can use the volume measure to convert everything back to good old polygons. And uh, yeah, I recommend uh, to work additionally with the remesher, the volume loader, and Alembics. Yeah, you've seen several possibilities of how to make good use of volumes, and I believe it's a perfect method for a great variety of projects, especially for abstract and graphical designs. And as you've, as you've just seen, it's really good for modeling, animating, animation and simulations. And you are able to produce impressive results in, in a very, very short time. And uh, yeah, in some cases, I don't have a clue how to generate uh, such stuff inside Cinema 4D with standard modeling techniques or with uh, other techniques inside Cinema 4D and without the help of external plugins and tools. So yeah, just have fun while experimenting. And uh, yeah, let's have a last look at all these example scenes we talked about today. This was the uh, intro for my retrospect, this um, underwater whatever scene, <laughs> the layered fog noises, and the pyro stuff with these falling and bouncing platonics and our rope simulations catching fire. Yeah, and that was all. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and thank you so much for your time.